Thank you, everyone, for coming to this session. It's lovely to see you here. On my right, as you probably gathered, is Juan Villoro, who is one of Mexico's foremost uh, young-ish writers, um, born in the 1950s, known for an absolutely seminal novel called El Testigo, The Witness, um, which interestingly segues into his very latest collection of short stories known as Los Culpables or The Guilty. Um, we could talk about the connections between um, witnesses and, and the guilty. Um, but it is, El Testigo was the one that really brought um, politics into writing in a very particular way uh, in the 21st century. And because the two are so inseparable um, in Mexico, and because Juan works so much in shorter forms of communication, including short stories and a lot of uh, journalism, I think at a PEN event, it's very appropriate to talk perhaps a bit about the role of the writer and the activist. It struck me very much when I first went to live in Mexico that there is no such thing as apolitical. Here, lots of people say they're apolitical. They don't care one way or the other. They don't have any politics. I've never met anybody say that in Mexico. And um, Mexico in 2000, when El Testigo came out, was the, the, the year when the party of the institutionalized revolution, if you can believe the name, mm -hmm. of the national party that had been ruling the country since the revolution of uh, 1910, uh, was on the route to losing power. So um, I think that's probably enough said that we ought to try and get football, sex and drugs in there somewhere too, because that's essential reading, uh, particularly in your work, I think. And my name is just Amanda Hopkinson and I'm an academic, a professor of literary translation. I translate books uh, very often, it seems, from Mexico. Um, and I've even had the pleasure of translating um, some things by Juan. So shall we kick off with, is the writer ever a pure writer, or is the writer ever always um, integrating no. um, what's going on with the writing? Well, uh, thank you for, uh, so much for being here. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing this discussion with me. Uh, I think that uh, any kind of writer uh, can uh, choose whether he's involved with reality or whether he is involved with uh, an imaginary uh, world. I don't think that uh, uh, a writer has the obligation or that he has to be compelled to address uh, real issues. Uh, a writer can feel free to write love poetry or science fiction or uh, fantasy novels in any kind of reality, even in the troublesome Mexican reality. I can speak for myself, and there are many writers. Here's Elena Ponatoska, who is one of the best examples of a great writer who is at the same time an extraordinary journalist, and most of her work uh, uh, relates to uh, real issues, whether they are the lives of persons who uh, really existed or uh, situations that have been a complicated, troublesome uh, in recent Mexican life. Uh, I try to uh, combine journalism mm -hmm. with fiction and sometimes both uh, genres merge and uh, in my novels, like for example in El Testigo, mm -hmm. of course politics plays a role. But I don't think that uh, fiction should be uh, determined by politics. I think that it's a natural outcome of what you write. And of course, being Mexico uh, such an unfair country in which maybe 50 million inhabitants mm -hmm. live in poverty and among them maybe 20 million in extreme poverty, you, That's uh, a, well, the populations were 120 million. Exactly, now, isn't the, it? The, so the whole population would be like 120 million, and mm -hmm. from these 120 million, you have like uh, 50 million mm -hmm. uh, of people impoverished, and then you have the uh, middle class that's be 
becoming a form of nostalgia because we are becoming more and more a, a, an unfair country in which there are 14 millions of super millionaires. And that's even worse because if you live in a country in which everybody's poor, I mean, uh, you can understand that that's the way of life for everybody. Mm -hmm. But if you live in a country in which the richest man of the world lives, which is Carlos, Carlos Slim, then you began to ask yourself, is this a fair country mm -hmm. or not? Do I want to live here? And if you know that Carlos Slim became rich because he received the telephone company as a monopoly, it was a state-owned company. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it was privatized. But it was not privatized as it happens in other countries in which uh, there are a lot of businessmen who uh, can have their own uh, telephonic uh, uh, communications company. No, he was given the whole of uh, <laughs> communications. So the monopoly changed from the state to one person. If you were making a call, <laughs> you were paying something to Carlos Slim. And naturally, he became the richest man in the world because he didn't need to, to have a very shrewd economic strategy to convince us that uh, we were going to hire his company because that was the only possibility. Mm. So if you live in this kind of country and you live as a writer, I think that you have a special responsibility because you belong to the privileged class in a way that you have access to culture, you have access to languages, and you can publish in a country in which many people, they don't know how to read. Or maybe they, they read, but they, they have no money to buy books, or they, they have no access to, to these places. In, in Mexico, for example, this, this kind of unfair situation mm -hmm. has to do with bookstores as well. 80% of the Mexican bookstores, 80% of the Mexican bookstores are in the neighborhood in which I live, Coyoacán, Coyoacán. in the south the part of Mexico. Of Mexico so, exactly. So it's so concentrated in this place. And At there least are you have bookshops there. Mm -hmm. We have nothing like Gandhi and Hampstead. Hampstead has the same boring water stones as everywhere okay. else. So, <laughs> you know. Well, but yes, no, there are no the perfect worlds. So uh, in, in, in Mexico, we have this, this kind of situation in which a writer uh, is a privileged person. And you know, there is a, a, a paradoxical outcome of being a writer in an underdeveloped country. And that is that you can address social issues, and I think that's, that's a responsibility of the writer, at least of the kind of writer I want to be. But at the same time, uh, you become, to a certain extent, and that's very dangerous as well, mm. you become a kind of a, a special guru, because since you are capable of uh, being uh, in command of language, mm -hmm. and since you can write in a, a country in which m many people have no access to culture, mm -hmm. then you are like a kind of sorcerer. Mm -hmm. You have answers to everything. So very often you have the, the, the example of the literary caudillo, yes. a, a person who can address all issues and speak about everything, tax reform, uh, uh, oil, uh, the democracy, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, no? So, and that's, that's dangerous. So I, I want to say from the start that I think it's very, very important to address social issues and to have a moral responsibility, but you have to acknowledge your own limits. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you end up like Mario Vargas Llosa trying to be president. And yeah, only, only in a country with no readers, a writer can be president. That's a very good point. Well, I wonder further down the, the echelons of, um, you know, also ambassadors and cultural attaches, how many long to be, um, but we won't go there. No, let's bring it a bit up to date because you talked about the right to read, which is something that camp uh, Penn campaigns for alongside the right to write. And of course, you highlighted that very much in a seminal article that you wrote for El País on Ayotzinapa, where the rubric was Yo sé leer, I can mm -hmm. read, because Ayotzinapa, well, maybe you should explain, but it was basically 43 rural teachers at a training college who combined literacy with literature in their lives and recently learned to, to read themselves, many of them. Uh, the sort of poor of the earth who were training to teach other people and you will say what's happened and what the campaign has been for from writers and readers since then. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I think the fight against uh, uh, an unjust reality, the fight for justice, is not only a fight to achieve a better uh, income. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays, uh, to achieve dignity, you have to have access to culture as well. You have to be a citizen that can uh, be active as a whole. And to be active, you, you need access. And you need access nowadays to internet and to the possibility of reading uh, books or whatever you want to read. So uh, teaching has become dangerous, especially in rural places. So the 43 students kidnapped in Ayotzinapa were trying to become teachers, those who teach to read. And that's very dangerous in rural Mexico. Uh, it's, you, you have to remember that the two main guerrillas from the federal state of Guerrero uh, were uh, led by former teachers, mm -hmm. were people who were trying to teach the, the, the students to read. And they discovered that the people, if, they, if their students were unable to eat, mm -hmm. they were unable to learn. So they, they, they began to fight for justice and they tried to fight in a pacific way. This was One back of them, in the 1970s, in wasn't the 1970s, it? the recent attack on the students was exact, last Exactly, um, Amanda. Uh, Lucio Cabañas was a teacher at Ayotzinapa, mm -hmm. and he was a rural teacher as well in the 70s. And he founded a civic association, mm -hmm. and he tried in a pacific way to change reality. And he was repressed, and the only solution he had was to go uh, into the mountains and to start a guerrilla farewell, warfare. And he was killed mm -hmm. and all of his, uh, uh, all of his, uh, I, I would say all of his associates or mm -hmm. all of the people who were with him, they were killed and it was terrible. Those years are known in Mexico as uh, the dirty war years. So there's a long history of teachers who want to change reality, first as teachers, but they say it's impossible to teach in such an unfair country. So uh, they decide to fight in another way, either politics or in the guerrilla. And these students were um, trying to teach. So it was incredible that they were kidnapped and they were, uh, they were given to the police. And the police, took these uh, students and gave them to the organized crime. So yeah, there is good. no border between the police and organized crime. They belong to the same uh, group. And that was an example of sheer impunity. Mm -hmm. And well, that's, because, that's why this is such an outrage. No, and I, in that article you mentioned, I remembered the last sentence that read Ernesto Che Guevara. Uh, one day before he died, he slept at a rural school and uh, the teacher of the school was trying to teach the students to read. And she had written a sentence in the billboard, in the blackboard, and the sentence was, yo sé leer, I know how to read. But there was, an, the accent was missing in one word. So one of the last sentences of Ernesto Che Guevara was to say the accent is missing. And uh, you can connect this desire to read, this desire to correct language and grammar with the desire of changing reality. So there's, there's a very strong connection. If you know how to read, you can become an independent person, a critical person, and you, you know or you, are, you can try to change reality. You can try to put the accent in the proper word. No? This is, of course, a symbolic accent. So uh, 
I think it's a very strong connection between these two stories, no? The one of Che Guevara, who was a great reader, by the way, and the one of the students who were repressed because they, they were trying to be teachers. Um, that is to change our reality. Absolutely. Well, I think just to go back very briefly now to, to the other writing that you do, the fiction writing, it's just, I love the way in which it does interweave um, other realities and then the characters, always very, very strong characters, and very, very good speakers somehow. And um, this one is a footballer, and he says, memories last a lot longer than legs, you'd better make them good. Um, because footballers have very short professional lives, as we know, but you have to make it. When you look back, because all writers draw first and foremost on their memories. How do you feel that the circumstances that you've grown up with and lived through in Mexico have informed your writing? Well, Me Mexico has changed a lot, but uh, one of the things um, I have uh, nostalgia for is uh, the hope of, for the future, because I belong to a very optimistic uh, uh, generation. Mm -hmm. uh, Elena Poniatowska wrote a seminal book on Tlatelolco in 1968. You were there at the time in, in Mexico. There was a massacre in the square of Tlatelolco. This, this, a lot of students were killed there. And Elena went to the jail where the, the main leaders of the students and of the teachers were there uh, in prison. And she interviewed all of them and she wrote a choral memoir about this that is called uh, La Noche de Tlatelolco. No? The Massacre in Tlatelolco in, in English. Th that's, it's known in English as Massacre in Tlatelolco. And when Elena interviewed one of uh, the leaders, Eduardo Valle, uh, who was known as El Búho, the owl, no? uh, he said to Elena, uh, the heritage of this movement uh, is not for my generation, because we are already in Yale. We were defeated. Those who are going to inherit our illusions and our hopes are our young brothers. The children who were 12 or 14 years old, who saw the demonstrations from the sidewalks. Those who knew that their elder brothers uh, were repressed and went to, to jail they are never going to forget this ignominious situation. They are going to grow up to be radicals and to avenge us. So he was, his hope was not for his generation, but it was for mine. And as soon as I went to university and I began reader, Mexico reading and so on, Mexico became a more open country. So there was a great hope for the future because we were uh, growing up to change everything. So there were new political parties. Uh, we began to have a certain democracy. For the first time, the Communist Party was legal. I belong to another party from the left called the Workers' Party, El Partido Mexicano de los Trabajadores, Mexican Workers' Party, uh, who tried to find a, a special Mexican way to socialism and so on. So, and there was more freedom of the press. So I belong to this very optimistic generation and we thought everything is going to change for better. No? But we know that this didn't happen. And in certain aspects, Mexico is even worse right now. So uh, it was really disappointing for many people that the fight for democracy couldn't have the, the right outcome. And we thought if there is going to be democracy, we are going to have the best possible party in power. And the worst party won the elections. So that's possible in a democracy, and especially in, a Mexican, in the Mexican one, in which elections are controlled. Mm -hmm. no? And you can have a, a, a state fraud in the elections. So uh, we had the worst possible party, the PAN, Partido de Acción Nacional, a party from the right, and they, they were in charge for 12 years. The people were so disappointed of this uh, change that they had nostalgia from the anti-hero, anti-hero who was the PRI. 
And they say, well, at least they knew how to rob us. They, they knew how to corrupt. So, that, and, I mean, it's a cynical situation, but it's like, for example, you, you have an elder brother who abuse, abuses you and uh, who is terrible at home and he's aggressive, but at the same time, he gives you something, no? He, he gives you money, he protects you, no? So that's why Octavio Paz called the Mexican system the philanthropic monster, no? The philanthropic uh, ogre, no? So uh, it's a monster, but that gives you something back. And the people had nostalgia of that monster, and they voted for the return of this terrible uh, party. And the, the party went back to power without passing uh, through self-criticism. So mm. they, they didn't renew themselves. No, they were the same cynical politicians that they were before, but uh, since they, uh, well, they pretend to know how to rule the country, but now we can see that the country is escaping from their hands. Into the hands of the narco-traffickers. And on that optimistic note, we're going to move on now to take just a few questions, because we do have to finish on time, but we're very keen to involve you if there are questions you'd like to put to Juan. So would any of you like to take up any of the points he's been making, particularly about the relation between the writing and the reality, which is, seems to be a key one here? If you don't, we're happy to go on talking. Yeah. yeah? Is there a microphone for the people on the floor? There is a roving mic. Ah, okay. So, I mean, thank you. This is incredibly articulate, and I'm incredibly ignorant. Um, so you're, you're helping me understand the situation. But um, I can't, you know, the, the, so when you're writing, you, so you, you feel that nobody's listening apart from the same dis pe people of, who, who have lost their hope, so your fellow colleagues. But perhaps internationally there's more opportunity. Do you feel um, excited about, for example, teaching external people at least about the situation? Or, or are there any circumstances in which you feel that your message can have some, some traction now? Because otherwise uh, I can only feel massive compassion towards you as an intelligent man in such a terrible situation. Uh -huh. Well, it's a very good question because uh, I think we have uh, at, at least or, or, or the reader I, I want to be, the, the reader and writer I want to be has at least two different tasks. One of them is to criticize this uh, terrible situation in which we are living, to investigate it, to try to find clues and to uh, try to find a meaning to certain things that seem to be extremely chaotic and they, they seem to occur with no reason whatsoever. Just to make sense is a radical uh, attitude in a place like Mexico in which uh, politics tend to be obscure and there are no explanations to these things. For example, we have been talking here about the Ayotzinapa kidnapping. The, the government has um, spoken about what they call the historical truth. They say the historical truth is and so they try to explain what happened. And the so-called historical truth, it's a mystery because they don't know what happened. So it's, it's a collection of rumors, contradictions, uh, and there are no people uh, responsible for, not for, for this thing. We don't know where the but students do are. Do you really so think there's nobody in government who knows no, what happened? No, of course, they know, but they don't want to say. So they know they don't want to say, and they call historical truth this thing. So now our... Yes, but what they say is the historical truth is not what some people know is the true exactly. truth. Exactly. So we know that the yeah, police uh, kidnapped these guys, that they gave it uh, to organized crime. Maybe, we don't know for sure, but maybe they gave it first to the army, and then it was the army who gave it to uh, this uh, organized crime uh, group this cartel, and uh, we know uh, many things, but uh, there are, of course, uh, things we have to discover and to investigate. So one of the tasks of the writer, that's an example, is to try to understand, to make sense, to build the context, and to uh, write the real 
truth about it. No, so the so-called historical truth, which is the official uh, uh, excuse for not saying the truth, uh, has to be challenged by another rhetoric, and that's the rhetoric of the the, the, the writers and the journalists. So that's one task that I think it's instrumental and it's very important. But at the same time, you were speaking about hope. At the same time, we cannot refuse uh, our joy of writing about pleasure, of writing with a sense of humor, of writing about sensuality, of writing about love and so on. So we have to keep on dreaming. We have to open a window of hope in this terrible situation and that's very difficult because in these trying times nothing is more radical than feeling good <laughs> because that's that's really really difficult so uh, i think literature at this has these two tasks being at the same time critical and celebrating this hope so because we live in an inferno we are capable of dream with paradise. So that's that's because we know these terrible things, we, we can dream another kind of reality. So to combine those aspects, I think, is the best way to resist. Because we don't want to go just uh, to another kind of country, just to the acknowledging of, the situ of this depressing situation. We want to imagine now a better world and to imagine a better world is to tell stories to uh, invent another kind of reality and that's what we are trying to keep the hope alive no and that's sometimes more difficult than criticizing the real world thank you very much we'll have one more quick question and then i think we're gonna have to can you give elena the Mike, first, That's please. the reason that Juan uh, writes Professor Zipper is mostly for, ch it's for children. very young people and very young boys. And he has also a daughter who is writing also a very lovely novel. So that would be an act of hope and an act of belief in the future and that this is going to go this is going to end someday. And an act of defiance. Yeah. Hell is going to end someday. Yes, yes, it's very important what Elena says about children literature. I always remember that the, the, the Green Brothers, they have a motto for their whole world. And the motto was, once upon a time when hope was useful. <laughs> and it's, it's wonderful because once upon a time there was this kind of kingdom in which you can ha have desires. So uh, writing for children is trying to make hope useful. Yes, absolutely. And just while the mic's traveling, um, just a couple of figures to bear in mind that are not so hopeful. We'll, we'll get back to hope again. Um, over 120 journalists have been killed in Mexico recently. 22 have been disappeared. That means we don't know where they are and if they will ever come back. Last year alone, 326 attacks on communicators, mainly journalists, were recorded, five of which were murders. And it isn't only organized crime that's killing journalists. Most of the attackers are officials or agents of the Mexican state. And we've got to finish now. I'm sorry, there's no time for more mm -hmm. questions, but you can maybe speak to, to yes, Juan well, afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the other upbeat side is that it's not only writers that tell stories open at random, and uh, we find that being an ex-alcoholic means spinning tales. And so you can go and uh, read Juan's book and find these footballers and uh, find these taxi drivers and find everybody else all telling you the most wonderful and extraordinary stories. So thank you very much for coming and thank you for sharing some stories with us. Thank you. Thank too. you all. Thank you.